So the dangers in the rise of the far right are many, we can all count them, but we don't hear often enough about what it means for the battle against climate change, which is why tonight we're so pleased to be looking at a timely and gripping book, White Skin, Black Fuel. It's the first in-depth study of the far right's role in the climate crisis, from fossil fascism to today's eco-fascism, and the many links between nationalism and climate denialism in the age of climate emergency. Our speakers tonight are three of the co-authors of White Skin, Black Fuel, Andreas Malm, Laudi van den Heuvel, and Anushka Zubkarter. Andreas is a scholar of human ecology at Lund University in Sweden, and the author of books including The Progress of This Storm and Fossil Capital, which won the Isaac and Tamara Deutscher Memorial Prize. Laudi is a Dutch investigative journalist focusing on conspirituality, libertarianism, and health. Anushka is a researcher based at the University of Sussex who explores the nexus between land, food, and right-wing politics. All three of our speakers tonight are members of the Zetkin Collective, a group of scholars, activists, and students working on the political ecology of the far right. And no great table of talkers would be complete without a brilliant chair. Our chair tonight is North London's incomparable Ash Sarkar, senior editor at Novara Media and lecturer in political theory at the Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam. My name is Karen Shook and I'm honored to be saying hello and starting things off tonight for Housemans, a proudly independent bookshop whose doors first opened in 1945 and which has been based in King's Cross in London since 1959. We specialize in books, magazines, and periodicals of radical interest and progressive politics, focusing on subjects such as feminism, black politics, LGBTQIA perspectives, the environment, socialism, and anarchism. And we also host events such as this throughout the years. Um, we open to the public once again in April after a year spent selling ever more books by mail order to readers all over the world. And we know many people tonight are joining us from further than the end of the Northern Line. Um, we're still selling books online. So if you're unable to visit the shop, we warmly invite you to order your copy of White Skin, Black Fuel at www.housemans.com. And let me just say this evening's part of our ongoing program of events and you can find out more at our website. And I'd really love to recommend two more events coming up later this month on the 26th of May, Not Quite Right for Us, celebrating Flip Die and Speaking Volumes. And the next evening, the 27th of May with Paint Your Town Red, How Preston Took Back Control and Your Town Can Too with Matthew Brown and Rian E. Jones. So tonight our event will run uh, until 8.30. Um, and once I flit off, our three panelists and brilliant chair will get stuck into what I know is going to be an enlightening conversation. And along the way, there'll be a chance to respond to your questions. I gotta say, Houseman audience questions are usually the best in town. So if you've got a question for the panel, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. That's the Q&A box, not the chat box. And Andreas, Laudi, Anushka and Ash will do their best to get to as many as possible. Thank you very much for joining us virtually. Over and out from me. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, rather fittingly for a book about fossil fascism, I am 100% gassed to be here. Do you get it? Gassed? Like, anyway, there's going to be um, a lot more bad jokes to come, so I'm really sorry if we're lowering the tone and keeping it there. Um, I've got to say, just personally, um, this book, White Skin, Black Fuel, it couldn't have come at a more urgent time. And for me, one of the most brilliant things about it is that it works through in such a detailed and rigorous way, the kind of imaginative connections which uh, form the tissue between the means of production, if we're gonna be vulgar Marxists about it, and the manufacturing of political subjectivities. And that's exactly the kind of work which I think the left needs to be doing. And it is done with um, no shortage of panache in this book. Um, normally when I have to read stuff like this for panels, I feel like I've been set homework, but I was 
gripped and underlining and punching the air. So if you haven't yet made the commitment to buying this book, um, get your hands in your pocket and uh, make sure you get a copy or rob somebody who has bought a copy. Um, so just to uh, open it out, because uh, I know that I'm not the person you really want to hear from, it's our esteemed panelists from the Zetkin Collect Collective. Um, I would just like to first invite you to just tell me a bit about this book. What's in it? Why did you write it? And what do you want it to do? Shall I kick off then? Yes, please. So yeah, um, well, I, I think I'm going to start a bit about the background of the collective at first, because that kind of also answers the question on what's in the book. So there are 21 comrades actually that contributed to the book and we're a pretty international group of people. And what we have done collectively is that we have investigated what the main far right parties have said, uh, written and done on climate and energy. And we have investigated the US, Brazil and 13 European countries, including the UK. Um, we don't deal with it couple of countries like Canada, Australia, and India, most of the global south, except Brazil. But what we do offer is this, this first insight in, in like the political ecology of the far right. Like very concretely, what um, are the far right parties acknowledging anthropogenic climate change or not? Uh, how does the far right mobilize uh, ecological issues to their advantage, for example? Uh, what are the ties with the fossil industry? What are the stances on renewables? Um, what are their ideologies actually uh, based upon? And how does this tie in with the, the aspect of race or racism? And the reason for the book, um, Tell me, uh, um, Andreas, if this is not true, but as far as I know, this is the very first, very first inquiry, which actually goes deeper into the ties between the fossil industry and race. Well, it's one of the um, kind of early boasts in the book that I remember, which is that in most of the accounts of climate change, there is no room made to think about the growth of the far right. And I kind of wanted to ask you guys, is, was part of this book intended as a corrective to the way in which climate change has been perceived as the business of NGOs rather than um, something which should form part of politics proper? Hello, Shka. You want to jump in? Yeah, um, I think actually the best way to answer that question is probably to to kind of guide you through the main themes of the book, actually. Um, and each chapter of the book aims to illustrate the existence and evolution of, of fossil fascism. And we kind of begin with denialism. And as climate change science developed uh, more significantly in the late 1980s, Alongside this, so did efforts to diminish the severity of, the, of, the, of these findings. Um, and our main argument in the book is that efforts to deny the reality on, of the climate crisis kind of equated to the preservation of business as usual and the doctrine of fossil capital. And we argue that this denialism came from the operation of, of the, what we call the denialist ideological state apparatus. And by this, we refer to the existence of a system of defined institutions, organizations and practices, which actually work to uphold some elements of the do of dominant ideology. Um, and by secreting a, a venom of disinformation, um, as we refer to it in the book, think tanks funded by those with vested interests in denying the climate reality carried out an endless flow of, of activities to delay any meaningful climate action. And over the following decades of denialist apparatus evolved and adapted and capitalist climate governance took the reins um, and implicatory denialism was very much alive and kicking as the greenwashing of this regime allowed fossil capital to expand whilst falsely claiming to undertake real urgent and necessary action in line with science and reason. And then obviously in the second decade of the 21st century climate denial was given a new life when it was integrated into the ideological state apparatus of far-right parties um, 
So in the book, we kind of argue that if primitive fossil capital was the historical engine of the denial machine, we argue that the far right had become its kind of exhaust pipe, if you will, just like the defenders of fossil capital, the far right are not tied to biophysical realities and their politics has never been constrained by what exists or not. And one of the things that was really helpful for me in reading the book was the way in which you sort of sketched out some of the political features of uh, fossil fascism, which broadly you defined as um, a, a you know, racial state um, sort of powered by fossil fuels. But you also talked about things like coal nationalism. And I was wondering if you could maybe just expand a little bit more on these, you know, little defining features of how you, you know, kind of make the connections between uh, the, the politics of racial purity and the material of fossil fuels themselves. Yeah, I can jump in. Let me just say, in response to the, the previous question, what's the purpose of the book? I just want to uh, say that, first of all, we, uh, from a scholarly standpoint, had the perception that th there was this massive research gap where um, the far right and its role in the climate crisis hadn't been studied. And uh, on, a more, on a deeper level, these sort of dimensions and aspects of racism in the climate crisis is also massively understudied. But then there is obviously also a political purpose to this project. And it is to, uh, to, to give a contribute, contribution to what we see as a kind of necessary convergence between uh, the climate movement and its allies and the anti-racist and anti-fascist movements uh, that, that exist. Uh, and since we're, I mean, since most of us are based in Europe, it has that kind of geographical bias. But it, it, clearly in Europe, uh, there is a lack of that convergence in that the climate movement is still in many countries uh, predominantly white and unaware of uh, racial politics and uh, in, in, yeah, insufficiently conscious about uh, the necessity of combating racism mm -hmm. and uh, of taking the climate struggle out of a sort of white middle class ghetto, if you like. On the other hand, uh, anti-fascist and anti-racist movements might not, on the other, might not be uh, fully uh, cognizant of how important uh, that struggle is, also in ecological terms. Now, uh, on coal nationalism and these things, well, uh, yeah, one of the arguments that we make in the book is that fossil fuels seem to be very useful for a kind of nationalist imaginary where uh, things like coal and oil and perhaps to a lesser extent gas can be regarded as part of the national body uh, and uh, legacy and heritage. So in, in Germany, for instance, the, the far right, the AFD, likes to talk about coal as something that will go on for a thousand years and it's part of uh, of the German um, national, uh, uh, yeah, heritage or, or something like that. And you see, you, you see the same on the, on the Polish far right. The, the Norwegian far right has cultivated a particular ideology around oil as, uh, as a Norwegian endowment and asset and those things. And it seems, it seems more difficult to attach this kind of nationalist imaginary to renewable energies. Although we might see uh, some... Uh, moves in that direction but but so far the coal and oil and gas have been much more amenable to that kind of aggressive nationalism i would say i, I wanted to sort of dig into the sort of myth around coal in particular which yeah. is you know a really potent uh, story in the english political imagination we think of that as the engine for the industrial revolution which by the way we did all by ourselves there's uh, no colonialism involved in that mm -hmm. just to nip that in the bud um and two it also has a particular function in terms of how the left conceives of itself and its relationship to workers movements that emerged out of um organizing in industrial settings also the way in which we think about things like the miners strike and so I was just hoping that maybe you could uh, you know unpack a bit more about this sort of um you know imaginative material this imaginative baggage uh, that comes attached 
to these fossil fuels. So not simply about the nation, but certain kinds of living, certain kinds of community uh, and certain kinds of you know, economy as well. We think the productive economy is being, you know, the one which is powered by coal is being more real than the yeah. consumptive yeah. oil-fueled one, for instance. Yeah. 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 Anushka, do you want to take this or shall I go? Um, you, maybe you go first and then I can chip in with, with things related to the yeah. UK's case, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I would like to point out that, that one of the members of the collective, probably the member who's done the deepest research on coal is, is Irma Allen, who's, um, who spent about a year with coal miners in Poland and, you know, going into the, to the mines and all that. And uh, Poland is, is peculiar in that it still has an industrial proletariat that is largely, in fact, still based on coal work. Uh, and it, it, there is in uh, Polish nationalism, as well as, of course, in, 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 in nationalism in, in, in the UK and the US and elsewhere, but it's, it's particularly strong in Poland because of the oversized role of coal in that country, uh, a special place in, in the national heart for the coal workers who, uh, are seen as a kind of, uh, you know, gritty, masculine uh, uh, carrier of um, an industrial tradition and uh, a, a, a certain romantic glow attaches to these workers. Uh, and some of this should be taken with, up, with utmost seriousness because uh, I, I don't want to in any way uh, poke fun at this and, and just say that all of that is illegitimate. But the the special role of that workers collective in nationalist in the nationalist imagination uh, clearly has more to do with with their uh, yeah their imagined role in the nation than with anything like anything as you know like class struggle or something like that. And that's not the, the the primary. You know when when Trump went to coal workers during his election campaign and said that he Trump digs coal and and he brandished a coal miner's hat and all that. Obviously that was not because he was uh, uh, animated by solidarity with a, a fighting working class and, and yeah. But it was about the idea that uh, coal workers are at the forefront of a project to make America great again uh, and all these things. Now on the, on, the, on the kind of complex relation between the left and, and coal, perhaps particularly in the UK, I'm, I'm not sure I have much to say, maybe uh, Anushka, uh, who's British herself, uh, has something to say on this. Anushka has got the same disease as me, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, actually, I wanted to just uh, highlight something else about Poland, because um, I was at the, the last, um, the second um, penultimate climate conference um, in Katowice, and uh, it was an interesting time actually there as well, because inside, um, as the host, Poland as the host, they'd uh, decided to kind of showcase coal um, in in, very, in a very visceral manner um, and they had it you know coal jewelry and kind of very much um, kind of narrated story of the history of coal um, as a kind of ingrained element of of Polish culture um, and so I think I think yeah whenever whenever we talk in the in the book but also kind of within the climate movement as well in terms of and um, talk about just transitions and things like that. It was a very interesting, um, lots of interesting talks happening within the COP, uh, the conference, the climate conference itself with um, unions, labor unions kind of um, making coalitions with, um, with coal miners and, and just trying to kind of generate discussion around, around how a just transition can actually manifest um, while keeping, you know, not to not fully demonize coal um, as being kind of, yeah, obviously it is sort of contributing a significant amount, but kind of creating a, a new narrative. Um, and I think in the UK, I mean, in terms of the left, I think, yeah, it's it's not something that I'm, I've been studying in that much depth myself. So I don't feel um, that I can perhaps comment on that. Um, but yeah, I do think there's something to say for uh, for this idea of a just transition, whether it's it's called that or not, um, and how 
how alliances and how new conversations can be started without kind of creating a, a hostile kind of environment of uh, yeah, which we which we see quite often. Um, I definitely want to come to this question of uh, the just transition. But mm. before we move on to our next question, I just want to remind the audience that there is a Q and A box. <laughs> so if you go into the bottom right, it is for me. It's a little button. That says Q and A. God, I sound like an old person trying to explain computers. Um, there's a little new hickey there, and if you are a user, I believe it's called a mouse. Um, if you if you click on the Q and A icon, you can type your questions because I want to have at least half of this time being dedicated to your questions for Anushka and Laudi and Andreas. So please get going with your questions. Um, but I do want to sort of, uh, towards the end, loop back to the question of the just transition, but I kind of wanted to probe just a little more into this question of identity and myth. Um, because one of the things that really came across to me, particularly in those early chapters, was the role of fantasy and the way in which um, fossil fuels became a kind of engine for certain kinds of fantasy about the self and collective identity and the nation. You know, you already talked about Donald Trump um, doing this kind of photo op and, and speech with the coal miners with the hat. And it says something about masculine potency. There was those chants at the Republican National Convention of drill, baby, drill, which is, of course, you know, super duper phallic. That's just not my brain going there, but it's like super phallic and aggressive. And then in the 2019 general election here in the UK, when Boris Johnson drives a bulldozer through a wall which says, you know, get Brexit done. And it is this um, image of virility, can do, you know, petrol fueled uh, agency, really. And so I just was hoping that maybe somebody could talk to me a little bit more about the role of fantasy and the way in which maybe the far right are able to play on. Uh, I guess the delusion, the collective delusion that we can keep using these fuels and it's going to be fine um, to itself power a fantasy and a delusion around a racially pure, homogenous ethno state. Laude, do you want to? Yeah, I can try to say something about it. It's a, it's a very big topic because that's the question actually about what drives these people to believe in those imaginaries. Um, I think also it is like climate change is a big thing that changes the world in, in, a, in such a big extent that we have to change certain things in our lives. And that's very, very scary. Um, so this imaginative history is also, I think, used to kind of create this history of, of who we are and, and where we are and, and what we are. And, um, and what we want to be, maybe. I think also that the uh, Frankfurt School actually has done research on, on why the far right uh, has these imageries of, of like um, a very conservative idea of what, what the nation should look like and what, how we should be. Um, well. I think uh, if I can just jump in as well yeah. about kind of um, directly in relation to how, what we discuss in the book, which is kind of building on a definition of, uh, of fascism from Roger Griffin, who identifies it, it it's from its mythical core as kind of this, what he terms, palingenetic ultranationalism. Yeah. Um, by the way, I want Sorry. to give you like five pounds for pronouncing it correctly the first time, because every time I've tried to say palingenetic <laughs> ultranationalism, I have to like spell it in my I head. I mean, there's so many tongue twisters and word soups in this book. I think anyone that can, <laughs> anyone that can read the whole thing out loud, it deserves, you know, something. There's what. like a 20 quid stapled in the back of each yeah. book. So that's another reason that you should buy it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm um, sorry, I interrupted you. That's okay. Really um, but no, I was just going to say about kind of this ultra nationalism being kind of built around a sequence of kind of this this past sense of grandeur and kind of blending into a kind of present crisis and then kind of a coming rebirth of of the nation and and kind of romanticism for what it was. Um, 
so, but in the book we kind of look at how as the far right now moves into a warming world and we have kind of contemporary far right um politics and practices we find that the myth of palin defense actually rather than palin genesis is actually quite poignant to help explain how the far right today acts in in response to an existential threat or what they see as an existential threat that's kind of been encroaching on the nation since time immemorial um and i guess yeah it's in it, this kind of idea of myth 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 and uh essential essentialism and kind of romanticism of the past it's it's very visceral in, in so many of the politics of the far right and i think you see it in kind of Fidesz government in Hungary, um, kind of maintaining this historical legacy of defending Europe against the Muslim invasion. Also in, in Spain um, with Vox and them starting their campaign, um, election campaign uh, a couple of years ago by starting it in, um, in a national park where supposedly they claim the Reconquista began to kind of drive the Moors back where they came from, yeah. So these kind of these kind of fantastical uh, elements are very are very defined within within the politics of the far right in many countries. Well, just to pick up on that note about romanticism, because as I was reading this, I kept thinking about something which I get an awful lot from, you know, fascist trolls online. Because one of the things they love to do is send me pictures of white women like in nature so there's this like a very slim very willowy looking white woman sort of standing next to a tree and encoded within that image is this idea of you know certain races of people emerging from the ground like you know a spring of clear water and implicitly i'm a kind of you know dirty imposition on the land and i see these pictures and i'm like she looks like a perfectly nice lady i don't know what you want me to do about this but <laughs> like okay um i'm thinking about that tension between the kind of you know very aggressive masculine like you know we've got to get our hands dirty and this is the energy that'll do it contrasted with the the images of the nation which are presented as feminized and natural and romantic and so I just wanted to ask you about how do you see that tension playing out and which of those do you think is is perhaps the most dominant um in the contemporary far right can I say something about that I think the image of of the women and the nature isn't necessarily feminine in itself because the imagery is very masculine because it builds upon this very clear idea of uh, the clear separation between men and women and the role that men and women have in this world or should have according to very conservative ideas. So to that extent, I think, even though it might look feminine in the first place, actually, I think it's a very masculine imagery. Well, I mean, it is like, you know, ah, uh, yes, the two gender roles, men yeah. do the digging and women stand exactly. in the trees. Exactly. Like that's the, that's the world we live in. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I take that point. But if, I mean, thinking of, uh, just about the way in which that is a tension, this element of, of the romance of land and connection to land and what that means in, in explicitly racial terms and the pursuit of economic activities and extractive activities, which, you know, are literally poisonous and destructive to that self same land. So I was just sort of wondering how, how you see that tension play out. I mean, if I can say so, I, th I think that one of the arguments that we make in the book is that so far, all indications are that the kind of masculine digging pro technology side of this coin always wins out in the end. And the sort of feminine, caring for nature, willowy woman pole uh, loses out. Uh, and there is exactly as you say, there is this tension between uh, uh, outright anti-ecological tendencies on the far right and a version of far right ecology that we call green nationalism. Uh, and it, it's perhaps like that we'll see more of the kind of green nationalism tendencies uh, emerging, not the least because of what's going on in France and, and the, the importance of, of, a, of a version of ecology for Rassemblement National and Le Pen. Um, and, and obviously the very scary prospect that she would be the next uh, French president. But 
at the end of the day, it, it, so far, it seems like uh, when when fascists try to do ecology, they always fail. Uh, not not because of you know any innate human limitation, but because fascist politics is about strength and domination and power. And uh, so far, that has always meant maximizing technological prowess and capacity and drawing on all uh, fuels available. Uh, and there is this, this incredible tradition of, of fascist fetici fetishization, another tongue twisting term, <clears throat> uh, of, of fossil fuels uh, with you know, smashing things and driving uh, against all the hurdles and, and stuff like that. That's, that's very much alive on the far right. And I think we'll see more of it. Let, let me also just point out that I think those mythical aspects of the far right are really difficult, re really hard to understand uh, how th how these things work, and what exactly are the kind of emotional and psychological ties between uh, fossil fuels technologies and ideas of masculinity and, and nationality and whiteness. And I don't think that we have any uh, ambition to present an exhaustive account of this. We're just scratching the surface of something that's that goes deep and needs more analysis. I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys about, particularly because of, you know, the title of the book, which is sort of a play on uh, Franz Fanon's seminal text, Black Skins, White Masks, um, is thinking about the role of colonialism. Um, I was thinking this uh, last year um, when, when, you know, most of Australia was on fire about why is it that, um, you know, settler colonies are often some of the most ferocious hotbeds of climate denialism and is it this idea that you know it comes from a rejection of you know the idea that the land you conquered could exert any kind of constraint over you you know a kind of civilizing white man like you know is there something very deep about that story um which is like what we found is terra nullius and we we cultivated it by imposing you know european models of cultivation and extraction and this idea that there could be a backlash against any of that is simply not not compatible with our ideas of of the nation or who we are as a people or where we came from yeah absolutely uh that's oh, great so you disagree with me Fantastic. no no no, 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 no let me say <laughs> You, uh, I remember that film that you produced on Australia, and it was it was absolutely brilliant. And I think that it's there's something absolutely central there in the settler colonial project, uh, accepting no limits and having limitless expansion at the core of its its its, its, its political self understanding or, or identity. And if you can brook no limits, then when someone all of a sudden comes and says, "Well, there are actual limits to what you can do," you can't keep on digging up all of this coal as, as you do in, in, in Australia, for example. That's just an unacceptable idea to, uh, to that kind of politics, I guess. Uh, so uh, as, as Laura mentioned at the beginning, Australia is one of the key countries that we have left out of our research so far, but we might have a, a new collective member who's, who's going to look into Australia. Uh, and I think Australia and Canada uh, a comparison between them and the role of the far right in, in its very aggressive defense of fossil fuels in those countries uh, and, and relating that to theories of settler colonialism as a particular kind of power would be very, very illuminating. I was going to also um, ask you guys about the role of Fanon. So did he just provide um, a snappy title because he was really good at titling things? Um, or, or was there something more that Fanon was doing for you um, in your investigation and in your work? Someone wants to say something? I think you're the, the best person to take that question on, to be fair. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I, I, was, I have always been an avid fan of Fanon, um, and uh, uh, we draw upon him at various stages in the book, uh, as have... Uh, other political ecologists recently who have found you know sources of inspiration in in some of his writings for thinking about um, how environmental destruction goes hand in hand with colonial uh, power that is not to say that there is a ready-made ecological theory in in fanon's work i think but that's the case with marx as well and, and marx has inspired a lot of work in a kind of eco-Marxist vein recently. And I think uh, uh, Fanon and 
other thinkers of his kind um, uh, represent untapped potential for um, a, a more, uh, yeah, a deeper inquiry into the nexus of colonialism and ecological destruction. I mean, I know that this is one of the countries which was um, left out of the investigation and, and kind of as the collective grows and, and your sort of terrain and area you can cover expands, maybe it will get looped in. But I keep thinking about the relationship between uh, India and in particular, you know, the government of Modi um, and what that kind of relationship with Boris Johnson's government and Donald Trump's government and so on and so forth. And, and a sort of coming back to that bit of fanon which is you know the kind of the relationship between the global south and the global north being mediated by you know an extractive and exploitative you know bourgeoisie of color essentially um in the global south and and the way in which um you know continuing environmental degradation and fossil fuel extraction is then dressed up in the language of decolonization of well don't you want us to develop don't you want us to um you know be free of the the shackles and servitude um, in relation to the global north and i was wondering if if you guys in in your investigations have sort of seen any kind of productive or imaginative connections between uh, the appropriation of decolonial language and logics for continuing fossil fuel extraction um, in the global south and the kind of language of emancipation and liberation that the far right use um, in the global north. I mean, just briefly, the first one that comes to my mind is Bolsonaro's Brazil in a kind of warped sense of kind of decoloniality of uh, the Amazon fires, for example, kind of the rejection of NGOs or kind of the the purging of NGOs from the from the from the state and kind of this rhetoric of them um, in a sense having a a, con a a control over the environmental aspect of of their governance and how they deal with their their natural resources. Um, that's probably the first one that comes to my mind, but I don't know if uh, Andreas or Laudi have any others that they can think of. Well, let me just say that, that Fanon's critique of the national bourgeoisie is a perfect example of, of uh, ideas that could be used from his writings and, and applied to precisely the, the question of, of fossil fuels. The, the country that, that comes to my mind that I know a little bit more than India is Egypt, where the current uh, extremely uh, oppressive regime of, of uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is constructing what will be the continent's, the Africa's largest coal-powered uh, power plant, uh, with, with imported coal, obviously, but where that ties in with his, again, in a warped decolonial fashion, uh, a project of building this um, uh, hyper, uh, how shall I put it? hyperpotent presidency with uh, yeah the, the largest museum in the world that was now recently inaugurated with all the pharaonic stuff and a new mega city and, and these you know this this mega construction projects that that include this uh, horrible coal-fired power plant and uh, yeah uh, i think it will find this in many countries in the global south nigeria is, an, is another mm. obvious example and, and lots of, of fossil fuel producing countries um, uh, have have fallen into this trap, and uh, yeah, a phenomenon analysis of that is is long overdue. I think. I mean, just to move things on a, a little bit, um, I just sort of wanted to touch on your discussions around green nationalism, um, and in particular, this idea that the world is is an overgrazed commons, um, but its proper custodians are white people. So, in order to deal with you know the overgrazing of the commons, you've got to tackle. Uh, population growth in Africa and in Asia. And these aren't fringe ideas. You hear this coming from the heart of the British establishment. It's being pushed by everybody from David Attenborough to Prince William. So do you think that this uh, specific kind of demographic anxiety is going to be the bridge between climate denial, white supremacy in the far right and you know, the kind of more ecologically minded bits of the establishment, right? 
I don't know who wants to take that. I wish that was true, but it feels too positive to say that it's the bridge between because it, I have the feeling that the idea, like the Malthusian idea of overpopulation is actually the core of the problem as well. So I don't see it as the bridge, even though, because I think also in the book, we, we kind of explain why this idea of overpopulation is not, is not actually the problem. Um, by, sorry, by, I, yeah. by bridge, I meant um, the thing which can connect the kind of uh, rough, boisterous, far right and the establishment right wing. That's that's the bit I was bridging, not the... Um, oh, okay, okay, then, not, then I agree I wasn't with like, you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, so I wasn't like, overpopulation. No, I thought you like meant brown between people. the far right <laughs> and, you know, um, environmentalists. Uh, no, 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 no. no. Sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't worry, that's okay. <laughs> no, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think it's the bridge between the far right and the establishment, and that, that is the problem indeed. Because it, it seems like to me at least, that the idea of, of Malthusianism is so big that it kind of, um, you, you see it across the establishment and the far right, and that is what binds them in their ideas on what the problem is with the environmental issue, with the, the environmental state. So, yeah. Yeah, I think in the UK especially, this is really interesting because we have very much kind of developed or kind of building upon this green nationalism within the Conservative Party. Uh, a lot of their claims for Brexit were built on um, taking back control of, of, well, British agriculture, for example, but also kind of this this uh, 10 point plan they've now developed to kind of uh, re-green the country, They're investing a lot in rewilding campaigns. Um, and a lot of the rhetoric during the Brexit campaign was very hard in on romanticizing um, nature um, a lot of rural populism going on. Um, and then if you look at other uh, extra parliamentary kind of uh, far right ethno nationalist groups that we have in the UK, such as Patriotic Alternative, um, they're very much, I mean, Far, their far right ecologism, if you want to call it that, is is very extreme, and and they're very much focused on very similar narratives as uh, worryingly as what the conservatives are pulling. But they're not afraid to kind of say who it is exactly who they think are the enemy, who are the targets. Their population kind of their ecology is not ecology; it's population ecology, and their Malthusianism is is right there in center. Whereas the conservatives kind of they, they kind of push it in there with their climate change plans and things like that. But in essence, it's kind of, they're sharing a lot of their, yeah, the bridge uh, metaphor, as you said, is a very good one in that sense. Yeah, patriotic alternative, why don't make jokes about having babies with white people anymore, man. Mm. I'm just like, steer clear yeah. of that whole, <laughs> Nasty that whole world. Um, yeah. But I do want to, you know, just as we sort of um, come a bit more towards the Q&A, which I'm very excited about. So please, if you're watching, get your questions in there. They can't be any more stupid than my questions. Hopefully I've made you feel a lot less embarrassed and inhibited. Um, I'm about to ask people what their star sign is. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, not really, maybe at the end. Um, so yeah, get your questions in there, don't be shy. Um, I wanted to come back around to this, this question of the just transition. Because for me, again, um, what I just found so interesting about this book and the thing which I could just guzzle more and more of is the way in which you sketch out the relationships between um, you know, so, you know, the means of production and also values-based containers for political identities and movements and you know, essentially uh, how that shapes um, the horizons for political activity. And the idea of the Green New Deal has become now, I think, almost an object of faith for the left, which is an idea that workers can be, um, as you guys put it, the beneficiaries of a transition uh, away from fossil fuels. But you also flag some challenges facing this way of thinking. And I was just wondering if you could talk me through some of them. Whoever wants to take it. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, can, I, I can give it a try. There are big challenges here, uh, and, and one of them is that there are parts of the working classes in various countries in our part of the world that have 
uh, effective ties to uh, fossil fuel extraction, but perhaps more important, uh, the, the consumption of, of fossil fuel technologies, not the least a car. And uh, some segments of the working class will be more difficult to win for a project like the Green New Deal than others. And those that self-identify as white and as male and uh, sort of kind of are very defensive about that identity also tend to be quite retrogressive or reactionary when it comes to climate politics. And uh, the, I think the, the strength of these ties means that uh, the struggle for a Green New Deal will be very difficult to win even within the working class itself. And some, some, some of the conflicts around fossil fuels in Europe recently, notably that in, in, in Germany and around coal in Germany, uh, there we've seen organized labor being uh, one of the most uh, you know, hardline defenders of continued coal production uh, and really an obstacle to, to progress. Uh, and you can, of course, you can argue that this is because of the power of the trade union bureaucracy and it, it has to be uh, overcome and uh, unions need to be democratized and all that. But there is also an element of, of uh, how should I put it, certain working class communities that are uh, deeply invested in things like coal. And and this is a political problem. It's it's not it's not very easy to uh, to win those people over. That's that's what the German experience tells us, I think. Isn't there also a problem of um, the impact that deindustrialization has had yeah. on communities, right? So you have the the memory and the experience of this trauma, and an experience of a transition away from heavy industry and a transition away from uh, fossil fuel extraction. In you know in the global north meaning um the kind of dissolution of community bonds increased yeah. precarity um you know even just your family moving further and further away in order mm -hmm. to seek out jobs i mean isn't this a problem of of you know what will our communities look like if we don't have this yeah and the, and the problem is that the climate transition is perceived as just another a continuation of this deindustrialization so just another rod with which to beat up the workers that are, have already suffered in, 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 in several decades. So what do you then make of, of the attempts to make it more palatable by, you know, some people in the UK said, don't call it a Green New Deal, call it a Green Industrial Revolution, because it's something which appeals back to an imperial, uh, you know, past, has an attachment in some ways to this uh, emergence of, of fossil capitalism, which forms the core of, of a national story and a national identity. I don't know what you guys make of that as an attempt to um, deal with that problem. I mean, I guess one of the, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> but we just, I just, uh, we end the book actually by, by saying quite blatantly that um, while some commentators actually posit that the right, including the far right, can be kind of coaxed into caring for the climate if it's told that that it's a form of patriotism or a, a, a way of building the strong nation. We, we argue that no climate movement should ever kind of set foot in that territory and that this is kind of, well, I think that what we say is actually, this is the road to Christchurch. And I mean, these kinds of, these kind of narratives, they are being written about. There's um, a book by Anatole Levin on nation on climate change in the nation state. There's many actors who are who are kind of pushing for a kind of well progressive nationalism they like to call it. Um, but yeah, I think that our book is is kind of a a very in depth sort of warning to kind of walking down a, a dangerous road in that sense. But I don't know if Andreas wants to chip in or something. Well, maybe we could take this opportunity to move on to the q and I'm very pleased to see that the box is filling up, but you know, we could, we could always use more. Um, I think this is a really nice question to start with. This is from anonymous attendee. I'm just gonna assume that's their real name. Uh, what is the most surprising aspect of the book to the common reader? I'm sure some of the research and ideas confront common expectations. So yeah, maybe each of you can answer that question. For you, 
what is the most surprising aspect of the book? Either something you came across in writing or something you came across in reading some of your other collectives contributions. Shall I start then? Yes. I think for me, when I started with uh, researching the far right and, and how they actually deal with climate change and all that, uh, I didn't know that there were actually, that there was something like green nationalism in that sense. That was very new to me because it can be very, very hard to actually distinguish green nationalism from actual environmentalism because it kind of looks like it is dressed up like environmentalism, but it in the end isn't because it doesn't serve the planet the way it should be. So to that extent, I think for me, that is the most um, surprising thing that actually far right parties can have this green image, even though they aren't. Uh, what about for you, Anushka? Um, I think my kind of revelations that I was having an increasing number of, I mean, there's many, but if I uh, pick out one of the most startling ones was probably understanding how, how much rebranding happens within far right actors and how some members of sort of some leaders of some groups, for example, in the UK, um, the Generation Identity UK movement uh, got disbanded and then the leaders of that kind of merged into kind of rebranding themselves into a new form of environmental campaigning, um, focusing on localism and that kind of stuff. Um, so I think the, the scary thing for me was, was reading and learning and uh, understanding how shape shifting happens and rebranding happens and it makes it even more difficult to understand who's behind certain movements and the power that they have and how they're networked and things like this so that would be the main one that comes to mind right now uh andreas for you what was the most surprising bit of the book well yeah i mean the the far right constantly throws up crazy insane ideas and that can be almost amusing to an extent i mean the whole q and on uh, and yeah well the all the conspiracy theories i mean one nuttier than the other it, 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 all that stuff can be quite surprising but but the the far right, i would say earlier on the in the book the far right in the climate crisis is a moving target and it's in a state of flux and it throws up innovations and one of the surprising things that struck me towards the very end of producing this book when we wrote the postscript was uh, what Boris Johnson said about wind power, because we have we argue in the book that the far right almost everywhere hates wind power and has, an, has something of an obsession uh, with wind. But all of a sudden, Boris Johnson flipped and said that it was offshore wind that propelled our country to commercial greatness. And then he made all those references to... to you know, slave traders or yeah, classical uh, heroes of the British Empire. So all of a sudden, and this was quite surprising, you could actually invest some some white nationalist imaginary into uh, one source of renewable energy at least. And I'm sure the far right will produce more surprising, you know, turns of crazy nationalist thinking. Uh, well, that, that kind of answers the next question, but I'm still going to pose it anyway to kind of extract a bit more detail. This is from Alexander P. Even though to the far right it, re it represents an unacceptable break from business as usual, could we potentially expect some far right parties to come to accept the necessity of renewable energy sources? So we've got a kind of yes with Boris Johnson, but even thinking about you know the kind of hard edge of the far right, do you think that there would, might be some shift? Uh, by parts of them towards accepting the need for renewable energy sources. Anyone wants to chip in? I think it might also depend on what kind of renewable energy we're talking about, because there are several kinds. And it seems to be that most of the far right parties are especially against wind energy, but not necessarily against other types of energy, uh, renewable energies. So maybe it depends on what kind of renewables and also to what extent a country has access to actually fossil fuels or to what extent they need to import it and how that affects economy. I mean, can I abuse my position as chair? Well, actually, I'm asking myself for permission to abuse my position as chair. 
I say, yes, I can abuse my position as chair. Um, I was thinking about, you know, this kind of, you know, drive to, to dominate the natural world and that being a feature of fascism and thinking about, well, is there some kind of imaginative connection to the work of my colleague, Aaron Bastani, this idea of fully automated luxury communism, that the right kind of machine and the right kind of technological abundance will get us out of this and it will itself represent a new kind of uh, conquest over uh, the, the limits of what the natural world can provide. Is there some kind of overlap there? Is it just that, you know, it's, it's men talking about like driving ever forward? Um, I think Andres, it might be interesting for you to just quickly discuss, there's a chapter in the book where we focus on a uh, historical uh, evolution of fac fascism, uh, looking at uh, Mussolini's Italy, uh, and the machine, the fetish of the machine, and how that relates. I think Andreas is probably in a better position. That to was talk the about part that. I was thinking of. I was yeah. reading, and I was like, "Is this a subtweet?" Yeah, subtweet? I'm just wondering if Andreas has any ideas as to how maybe yeah. that fetishization could transfer over yeah, to like, yeah yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. So I'm reluctant to say that there is an overlap between the fully automated luxury communism stuff and the, the fascist ideas that we deal in, we deal with in this book, but. There is a left version of machine fetishism in uh, the kind of Promethean uh, uh, current within Marx Marxism, where the mastery of nature, which is something that Bastani actually <laughs> talks about in, in an affirmative way in the book, where the mastery of nature is seen as a progressive force. And I think that is a deeply problematic uh, part of uh, of the left historically and at, at present as well. I, I mean, I personally have several problems with some of the ideas that he lays out in the book, but I mean, let, let's 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 bracket that. Let's leave that out for the moment. Uh, but I think this is this is something slightly different than the fascist uh, uh, machine cult because there it is always about one racially defined group of people dominating another by means of the machine. You don't get that in the kind of left Prometheanism. It's the idea that in the end there will be communism because of the machine. And that's a, that's a different political idea. It might be a, 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 a faulty idea, but it's very different from what the, the fascists are saying about the machines, I would say. Yeah, I was doing my best to stir up some shit there and you were actually like, very collegial about it, which is disappointing to me. <laughs> um, I've always got one eye on content. Yeah. Um, this next question is from Harry. Uh, a recent feature of far-right eco-politics is that borders are climate action. Does this have a longer history? And if so, what is it? Anushka? Go on, Anushka. <laughs> um, well, it, from a kind of, on a tangent kind of uh, um, path, uh, um, first comes to mind is is looking at kind of uh, this ecology is the is the ally best ally of sorry I'm getting that the wrong way around the border is the ally of, the, of ecology. Um, I'm thinking of the the guy the the start of the organic uh, the soil association for example in the UK and this the kind of back to the land movement and the the green wing of the British Union of fascists um, they they definitely developed this kind of combining the narratives of um, Nazism um, with the idea of this romanticization of, of nature and nature as being this kind of biotic nucleus of the nation um, with which the care, the care for the nation equated to care for the land. Um, and this kind of definitely is rooted in many of the countries that we looked at um, that expressed green nationalist um, politics and with far right parties. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at, for example, in Spain as well, um, Vox, the, the uh, ethno-nationalist far right um, party there, um, have definitely been uh, following a kind of climate denial line, but with a very green nationalist undertone um, and focusing on imagery um, and propaganda focusing around imagery of um, nature as being a way of kind of protecting this 
very romantic kind of notion of Spain um, and, and the land in which um, the, the extraction is taking place on. And so I think, yeah, it's, there's, there is definitely these narratives, but I think, I don't know whether Andreas wants to talk a bit about France. I think France is probably our, the best example we have with, with those discourses. But well, comrade Lise Benoit should should speak about yeah. that. She, she's <laughs> not uh, she's not on the panel. But uh, I, just very briefly in response to the question, the there is a, a long history uh, on the kind of murky right within environmentalism itself of advocating border controls as a way to to reduce the pressure on the carrying capacity of a nation and stuff like that. Uh, so you, you you can trace that lineage within environmental thinking itself, uh, rather than within well not not only within the organised far right, but within environmental thinking, and that's that's a problem because it it tends to pop up in various you know on the fringes of environmentalist discourse and environmental movements the idea that we need to reduce immigration uh, or focus on overpopulation to manage the climate problem, and that's something that we I mean, that, that's one of the core messages of the book, that the environmental movement should really uh, keep that at arm's length, uh, <laughs> always. I definitely want to come back to um, this question about dealing with the, the, the white nationalism latent within the environmental movement itself. But um, this is quite a good question from L. Uh, L asks, the current vaccine apartheid is giving us a scary glimpse into the future once climate breakdown becomes more accentuated in the global south. How can we mobilize the global north when the current situation shows us that we will continue business as usual as long as things are sort of okay in the imperial core? Who wants to talk to the global north? Not me, I'm a terrible message carrier for... Uh white people in the suburbs, someone else. Go on, Laudi, I can see you, you're tempted. Not at all. <laughs> oh, how can we mobilize the global north? Uh, that's the big problem, I think, because the, that the thing is indeed, like if you're looking at what the problems are inside your boundaries, you can't mobilize the north. <laughs> So it's a very good question, and I wish I had an answer to that. But I well, maybe no. maybe the question is rather than think about the global north as a homogenous whole, yeah, what are the sections right. within? What are the sections within uh, European countries that you need to mobilize and activate? Do you go down that route of um, trying to put together a youth-led, youth-based movement, such as the school strikers and that whole kind of, you know, Greta Thunberg thing, if you're selling out our futures, do you try and work with the trade union movements and get some, you know, um, industrial support for, you know, a green transition? Do you talk about it in terms of moral ethical terms? Do you talk about it in terms of class conflicts? Where, where do you start? Everywhere. <laughs> All the things you mentioned, of course. I think, you know, um, the, the Greta Thunberg thing is a very powerful thing because it reaches the whole world. So to that extent, it is a very good way to actually start the discussion because she has a reach and it apparently works, but it, it might not have worked. So where to start is a very difficult thing to actually say because sometimes things get picked up and sometimes it doesn't. But I think you should start wherever it feels necessary to that extent that you know you can you can start it everywhere but you never know if it gets picked up but all the ideas that you actually <laughs> mentioned of course all those things together but i don't think there's one solution that kind of mobilizes the north or the global north or no but all the things you mentioned i'll try and come up with some bad ideas and see where we get um you can anyone else want to Anyone else want to come come in on this about mobilizing? Yeah, yeah, um, I'm, I'm tempted. I, I mean, the the question pinpoints a very, very serious problem, and that is what seems to be an increase in callousness in the global north towards suffering uh, people in the in the global south, and th this takes many forms. One of them, of course, is the systematic uh, 
yeah, uh, actual drowning of people in the Mediterranean with, with, with the illegal pushbacks that have been uh, revealed recently and, and how they directly kill migrants that try to cross the, the ocean. And this, this uh, brutalization of the global north, if you like, is one of the key fascist tendencies in our present. And the, the vaccine, vac vaccine apartheid that was referred to in the question really is a quite chilling prefiguration of what can happen when, when climate breakdown intensifies. And it's also the case that it's, it's much more difficult to, mob to build mo movements in the global north based on, on solidarity with struggling people in the global south now than it was just two decades ago or, or you know, further back when you had you know, the movement in solidarity with the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, the, the Palestine solidarity movement had a, a completely different scale uh, a couple of decades back in our part of the world, uh, the anti-war movement. But since then, you see much less of that kind of, of solidarity mobilizing in the global north. And that's, that's deeply problematic. I would say that what, one category of people in the global north that has so far been, as, as I said earlier, virtually absent from the climate movement is racialized people who uh, uh, often maintain, we, we, we argue this towards the end of the book, maintain a knowledge of uh, the climate impacts uh, in the countries they originally came from or where they have their, 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 their origins at, at some point. And those people who are uh, the targets of, of so much far-right aggression in our countries really need to become a, a part of the climate movement if we're ever going to make that kind of bridge, to use that word again, uh, uh, and now a bridge between the, the North and the South in, in terms of climate solidarity. We can't so, build a wide climate movement in the global North. So, so why do you think that, I mean, there are two parts of this question. One is trying to explain the absence or alienation of racialized people from the climate movement. And then the other is the whiteness of the climate movement. These are interrelated, but also kind of separate questions. Why do you think that is? I'm asking three white people this as well, so I'm just going to enjoy yeah, yeah, the yeah, discomfort yeah. for a second. Anushka? <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, my first kind of response to that would be in relation to um, kind of nature conservation movements in the UK and specifically in relation to food production um, and rewilding and these kind of narratives and the way in which a lot of Oh, a, a large part of these movements often kind of automatically um, take on this kind of, this is contingent on outsourcing the harm um, of agri-extraction, for example, to the global south, where meanwhile we can kind of restore the nature in this country and kind of rewild and have a kind of the nature that we want to see um, and then kind of re reinforcing, sorry, this kind of colonial mindset of depending on the other to feed us. Um, and there's not enough people challenging this narrative, um, in my opinion, in the UK, um, which is where I'm based and that I can speak from. But um, And I feel like these, this is an issue that kind of stems out of not confronting um, colonial legacies in specifically relating to um, where our food comes from, for example, um, and a whole host of kind of the panoply that comes with that um, in terms of ecological and equal exchange, the kind of outsourcing of extraction in general, um, and this narrative of kind of saving nature as being an innocent and kind of apolitical activity, which it obviously isn't. So that would be my, my contribution to that. I mean, isn't there something a bit about in-group identities? Like, I've got a terrible confession to make, which was I was kind of late to environmentalism. And it's because my mum raised me with a deep suspicion of anyone that doesn't wash their legs. And I kind of was like, oh, well, you know, here are people, they weave jumpers out of their own back hair. You know, they want me to wash in toilet water. I'm not having it. You know, I, there, there was a kind of an in-group identity, which was as much a product of the demonization of environmental movements as it was a kind of actually existing lifestyleism that existed within it, which for me in terms of, you know, my identity as a person of color, and this is before we get to the experience of racism and before we get to questions of state violence and the kind of immediacy of certain kinds of survival, that I was just like, 
I don't want to be smelly. You know? I, I feel I like someone has to say something about this because I feel like I've just had this horrible confession of like, yes, that, that propaganda worked on me because it did. Still does a bit. I, I share the preference, the aversion, yeah. Yeah, I just want people to wash their jumpers. That's all I want. That's all I want. I want, <laughs> I want a green new deal and I want people to, to wash their jumpers. I mean, you don't have to not wash your legs. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, apparently, I've, I've bullied my partner into washing his legs. He's like, every time I'm in the shower, I look down and I hear your voice just being like, <laughs> wash your legs. So um, I, I suppose this is where yeah, the authoritarian tactics do work. Um, a, a couple more questions. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. Did you detect any generational differences amongst the far right in terms of attitudes towards the climate and the environment? Well, one instance that comes to my mind was the sort of brief revolt of the AFD youth chapter in Berlin against the hardcore climate denial um, uh, propounded by the quite old leadership of that party. Uh, that was unsuccessful. So in, in 2019, the, the youth wing of the party in Berlin said that we in the AFD have to try to accept the reality of the climate crisis and integrate it into our nationalism, because otherwise all of these young people who are out in the streets will uh, we be we can't win them if we if we stay to this line. That was unsuccessful, but but it's it is. I mean, you can't exclude the possibility that young caters in the far right realize that our future is green nationalism rather than uh, outright climate denial. Uh, if there is any generational gap, I would assume that it's of that kind. But I don't know if, if Laudia and Anushka have other opinions. I can say something about the Netherlands. It's, it's based on a bit of a feeling though, but if you compare, for example, Geert Wilders and Thierry Baudet, you, you can actually see Geert Wilders is like a little, a little older. Um, his kind of stance on climate change it's it's just it's non-existing and it's it's bullshit basically while Thierry Baudet is way more even though he denies the existence of climate change he does include some imagery of forests being important and he has opinions about climate issues or actually mostly environmental issues like degradation and such so I think to that extent he's more open to discuss these topics instead of just outright denialist. So maybe it, it does, I don't know if that is generational or if it's just the person, but there is a difference between those two at least. And there is also a generational difference between those two. Um, Anushka, do you wanna come in on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of age uh, demographics, I'm not 100% clued up with, um, with it all, but in terms of um, patriotic alternative, for example, in the UK, their followers and ma majority of them are young-ish, sort of 30, 30 and below. Um, and I guess, yeah, the anti-globalist kind of rhetoric that they peddle is, I think, attracts that kind of demographic and they, f I, I, uh, generation identity in general, I, as a movement, international movement does tend to have subscribers that are pretty young. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's all I have to say on that at the moment. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that you do say in the book is that, you know, the ecological movement has got to build a kind of firewall between itself and appeals to nationalism, patriotism, and that kind of, you know, thin end of the wedge, which takes you all the way to notions of racial supremacy and, and ethno-nationalism. Accepting that, how do you tell stories around community, collective identity and ways in which we can fashion a sense of belonging um, through the frame of, of climate action? This one's for you, Anushka. Is that, is that for a particular reason that you've got in mind of what you want me to say? 
No, but you've been thinking about the, those things about community and not the least in rural context and how that, how, yeah. how you can have an idea of a local community without nationalism. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely been something that I that I've been exploring a lot. Um, yeah, so taking the example of of localism and kind of moving away from capitalist uh, structures and ways of um, interacting with the environment specifically. Um, yeah, I think there's there's a lot to be said for creating an anti-fascist kind of anti-capitalist local local localist um, movement if you want to if you want to stick with the term localism um, but I think this is something to consider quite seriously because I suppose if if there is going to be a, an anti-capitalist kind of the all these kind of features of anti-capitalist movements such as degrowth for example um, need to think hard about the ways in which these narratives are being are currently being appropriated um, through far-right ecologism and how to resist those appropriations um, and I think also this goes when you talk about rural rurality and kind of how this relates in my research specifically I focus on um, rural populism and uh, I think there's a lot to be said in the UK for the ways in which rural, the rural has um, become a place of alienation of non-white people and the way in which our government completely denies, <laughs> denies that outright. Um, and there are some really inspiring actors um, that I've come across um, recently, uh, such as Land in Our Names, um, which are doing really amazing and inspiring work um, looking into land reparations um, for black and people of color in the UK, um, specifically in England, actually. Um, and I think that's really interesting, this idea of land reparations and, and how, how these, um, how this can kind of, how allegiances and alliances can kind of be um, manifested within um, environmental movements as well to kind of be allies and build up these kind of alternatives um, and these anti-fascist very much it's very much anti-fascist built into environmentalism but from a completely different uh, starting point as to what we have historically been offered so so yeah. I wanted to the thing you were saying about rurality is really interesting to me because one god yes every time I step outside of a city I'm like wearing a stab proof vest I'm like you will not kill me today um but it seems to me that thinking about ways in which you can have forms of collective identity tied to place in a way which is, you know, non-exclusionary of, you know, immigrants is that cities do that. Cities do that all the time. And you see that reflected in the kind of culture that comes out of it. So a defining feature of rap music is, of course, always you're repping your neighborhood, you're repping your ends. But it's always got this relationship um, to... Uh, blackness or to the story of migration and to this kind of you know outward looking transnational kind of identity but as well as intensely geographic and, and and that's why you know why I'm obsessed with with drill and with grime and with rap and all of it and then you you start thinking about forms of identity in the countryside and it's like you have to have like sprung out out of the ground like yeast or something do you know what I mean like you there's that sense of suspicion of newcomers and so are there just you know when we're coming back to this question of political identification and the values-based container which can mobilize people is that perhaps environmentalism presents the biggest problem because you're talking about land and relationships to nature and agriculture and cultivation and that is exactly the hardest place with which to have a non-exclusionary uh kind of of, of identification um yeah, yeah i mean uh, sorry sorry you know, go, go on Anushka. No, no, I was just going to say something short, which was just that uh, that the environmental movement, I think when it comes to kind of an inward looking nation based environmentalism, which has kind of been a very long standing uh, approach to environmentalism in the UK, for example, um, I think immediately people do think of the rural, they think of how we can 
re repair the damage that's been done to nature. Um, and that immediately brings the imaginary to rural places. Um, but those, yeah, I just think that that was the first thing that I, as you were speaking, Ash, that, that was something that came to my mind because obviously it is, I think, very hardwired into environmentalism in general is immediately thinking about rural ruralism and rurality, but then completely kind of, mar you know, marginalizing and uh, discarding the reality, which is that those places are inhabited by a specific type of person and excludes another type of person. So yeah, sorry, Andrea, so you go. <laughs> no, 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 I just think that, that Ash laid out a, a real paradox of environmental politics that I haven't really thought about before, but it's, it's actually very true that there, there is a, a contradiction in you know, yeah, the, the idea of the land being at the core of environmental politics, while at the same time, if there is one common denominator to the far right in all European countries that we have looked at, it is that it is always stronger in the countryside. I mean, the, it, it, that goes for every country. It's something that Stoll and I, another comrade in the, in the collective, have, have talked about and that we actually want to investigate. Why is it that the far right is so much stronger in, in the countryside. Well, maybe it's not very hard to explain, but yeah, it's a paradox that the environmental movement, the environmental left is always, on the other hand, stronger inside the cities, uh, while still not managing to be as racially diverse as it should be. Well, I mean, the thing that I want to ask is like, you know, what can very camp people do? Because I'm too camp to go to the countryside and what can I do for the environment while still having great 4G reception? That's what I want to know. That's what I want to know. Um, we've got we've got about five minutes left of this event, and I thought that maybe by way of wrapping up, because it's really hard when you go right wrap up everything that you said. This is an immensely rich and textured and varied book, and so you know the best way for you guys to get a sense of what's in it is to fucking buy it and read it. Um, but I would like each of you um, to perhaps. If, if there's one thing that you didn't get a chance to say already, but for you is a critical takeaway point, or not even a critical takeaway point, just a tangent that you enjoy. Um, this is a speak now or forever hold your peace kind of moment. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pick on everyone in the order I want them to go in. Um, maybe Laudi, if, if if you'd like to start. I go last because I have to think about it. Okay, right, right, right. Fuck it. Who, whoever wants to go first, go first. I just tried to do some interventionist chairing and it just it didn't go well. Well, I'm a bit unsure about what to say too, but I, I can take the opportunity to ask a question that's in, uh, at the top of the Q&A box, which I actually think is mm -hmm. a, a very good question. That's how, how should anti-fascists react to the greening of the far right? How can we be one step ahead of them before they start to adopt more green ideas. And I think apart from applying all the usual anti-racist propaganda, if you like, to the far right, which is obviously as relevant to a far right that claims ecological awareness as to one that doesn't, you can also make a strictly ecological argument against green nationalism. And that it is that it doesn't improve anything for the climate. So uh, a green nationalist concrete action, the massacre in Christchurch, where this guy inspired by French green nationalism entered mosques and killed like 50 Muslims, uh, supposedly to alleviate the pressure on, on, the, uh, on the, the world's ecosystems. How did that in any way contribute to the struggle against the climate crisis? Obviously it didn't, because those 50 Muslims had no particular role in, in, in keeping fossil capital going. Uh, and that's the case with all the forms of green nationalism because immigrants are not, and global, global over, all the population in the global south, sorry, is not the real driver of global heating. So uh, another crazy instance was uh, a politician from the Finns party who argued that the transportation of migrants is a source of CO2 emissions, which is, I mean, yeah, that's one I've heard before as well. So. Yeah, it, it has no no relation to reality. So uh, the, it shouldn't be a difficult case to make against the far right that it doesn't have any real solution to the climate crisis. Because the concerns of the far right, which are all about protecting the white nation, cannot go to the root of the problem, more or less by definition. So uh, uh, that, that, sh that shouldn't be hard to convince people 
on the assumption that people are reasonably rational, but that is not necessarily. Uh, that's a very opinion. big assumption. Yes. Um, exactly. So it's just because uh, we're short on time and I definitely want to hear from Anushka and Laudi, just in terms of the thing that you really wanted to say or perhaps a question that, that you wished you could answer or just a tangent that you want to leave people with. I mean, to be honest, Andreas kind of stole a bit at the end of what he said of what I wanted to say. So <laughs> I would just reiterate like that ecology for the far right is often a preoccupation with population ecology. And as in that sense, and kind of as we argue in the book, is a is just one shade of denialism. It's it's hindering and and it's an obstacle to kind of actually acting on on the reality of what is driving it, what is, is driving the the climate crisis and the the real root of the problem and and delaying and kind of distracting it's the distraction i think that is the the part that that should incite kind of frustration um so yeah just just focusing on more on kind of spotting where far right ecologism comes up and looking at how appropriation of narratives through green nationalist thinking Pop comes in and it can come in 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 places you might not expect to see um so yeah just keeping people's people keeping their critical hats on for where they find that in in the rhetoric especially Keep your eyes in the media. peeled <laughs> critical hats on <laughs> i like that um Naldi, if you wanna if you wanna take us home well, no, I have just a, a very tiny thing I was thinking about because you, you said something or we, we just discussed the idea that on the countryside, the far right is bigger than in the city. And actually, I grew up on the countryside and thinking about my family and my background, the people in my family actually do um, replicate the, the ideas that, that are there in the far right. And I think looking at for example my family and in, the, in the, the village i grew up in the problem is actually the absence of immigrants and the absence of knowledge and the absence of of the effects of climate change so maybe the problem is the absence of those things and the being scared of the unknown somehow i don't know but it's something that i've been thinking about a lot as well like why does my family in the countryside also believe these things and 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 talk badly about like immigration uh, and people that well, live in the cities and 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 you know there is not even a white person living in the city anymore that kind of stuff they they say that and and you're sitting there like oh god nice nice birthday party awful <laughs> it is <laughs> it's it, like these these people believe that and I think it's also because it's it's an idea in their head, which is exaggerated so much that it's hard to get out of somehow. So maybe the best way to actually fight that is to make those people meet other situations and to, to get a better understanding of, of the different worlds that people live in or the different people that there are around and that they actually aren't so different after all. Maybe that's I, very I, ideological, but I hear the point that you're making about contact and shared humanity. Yeah, that being really important. But are you going to make me move to a farm? No, you don't have to. Do you have to? They, they can come to you. They can come to me. They can come yeah. to me. All right, that's great. Just as I am going nowhere near livestock, I'm just making this very clear for now. To poo, poo stinks. Yeah, yeah. poo stinks. <laughs> I'm so glad that we've 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 um having come through a very intellectual and enriching discussion we've come back to a, a kind of core component of of what it means to live um as a corporeal being which is poo stinks don't want to be near it um I'm so sorry to have lowered the tone of actually your very wonderful book the three of you have been uh just such great panelists to chat to and I can easily talk with you for another hour and a half but um, my mum's just phoned me and I imagine other people want to get off and have their dinner. So uh, hopefully the audience can join me in saying a really big thank you to Andreas and to Anushka and to Laudi and a thank you to Housemans for hosting. And then finally to wrap up a big thank you to the audience for joining us when you know, it's legal to go to the pub at the moment. So the fact that you've chosen to stay in and listen to all of us is just great. Um, so yeah. 
Thank you all very much. Yeah, thanks so much to everyone and special thanks to Ash for a uh, wonderful sharing and intervention. <laughs>